Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Janssen. Hello, I am David Planchard. I'm thoracic oncologist at Institut Gustave Roussy, Vilgi, France. Welcome to this program title. Quick fire updates from Chicago. What's news for the EGF TKI refractory and resistant non small cell lung cancer? Joining me today is Natasha Leil from the University of Toronto and Princess Margaret Hospital in Toronto, Canada. Welcome, Natasha. Firstly, uh, we'll talk about the EGF mutation. Uh, we know that uh, outside of the classical mutation, there is a third common mutation who are exon 20 insertion uh, that might represent. Uh, two to 3% of non-small cell lung cancer, this population generally have a poor outcome in comparison to the common EGF mutation. We have currently some specific target uh, exon 20 insertion, and we will have some discussion with new compound ongoing currently in clinical trial. And we need to try to spare some specific toxicity, particularly digestive and cutaneous toxicity with a new compound. We have some efficacy of afatinib and osimertinib on some specific point mutation, but unfortunately, this compound generally have a low response in the EGF exon 20 insertion. So for sure, we need to have the new compound and we will have discussion for this population. And beyond the classical mutation of sensitive EGF mutation. We know nowadays we use osimertinib first line of treatment, and we need to have the further line of treatment, particularly to understand the mechanism of escape, either EGF dependent like C79S mutation, met amplification, which is really important post osimertinib exposition. There is also some other bypass activation pathway, piathrekinase, RAS, RAF activation, fusion, and also some cell lung transformation, and we'll focus some interesting data, particularly for the patient that develop a MET amplification post osimertinib. This is a quick fire program, and we'll have just 120 seconds to answer this question. So let's start. And the first thinking is probably, Natasha, what we have achieved in terms of efficacy and in terms of available and emerging targeting agent for patients with EGF exon 20 insertion. Thanks so much, David. It's so great to have two approved agents. We know that amavantamab is now approved both in the US and also by the European Medicines Agency, which is great news, as well as a growing number of other countries. Also, mobocertinib, which has been approved by the US FDA last year and has recently received a positive opinion uh, from EMA's CHMP uh, committee which of course you know will hopefully translate to EMA approval shortly. So you know these agents are different. Emavantamab is in Venus. The response rate is forty percent. Median duration of response at eleven months. Mobocertinib, uh, an oral kinase inhibitor. Uh, we have two studies there, or two cohorts. They're post platinum cohort as well as the Exclaim expansion cohort. Response rate ranging from twenty eight percent, with a median duration of response thus far, which is seventeen point five months, which is a uh, really extraordinary ordinary and 25% in the exclaim cohort and the median duration of response not yet reported. So, you know, it's really been great to have uh, two approved drugs in this space that we can now access for our patients and of course make things much brighter in the clinic in the second line setting. Thank you. Uh, just uh, on time. Uh... So, you know, there's so many new agents in development. It's been such an exciting time. You know, we heard about the CLN081 drug and um, you know, formerly known as D said D9008. What are the updates from ASCO on that? You get 120 seconds. So on this component, particularly the CLN081, which is uh, irreversible or uh, 
EGFR inhibitor, particularly developed for the exon 20 insertion. Uh, we had some interesting data, phase one, escalation dose cohort and uh, phase two expansion cohort. Uh, patient with a CNS metastasis stable for at least uh, four weeks uh, were also eligible in this uh, trial. The response rate uh, is particularly uh, promising uh, at 100 milligrams twice daily, for example, confirmed partial response, 41%, median duration of response more than 21 months, and median PFS, uh, 12 months. Tolerability was generally good, mainly some rash diarrhea, mainly grade one and grade two toxicity. The second component, uh, Shunvozertinib, uh, also developed particularly for the exon 20 insertion, uh, phase one, phase two, dose escalation, dose expansion, uh, two different trials, one in China and one outside of China. When we look at the data, 52 patients have been included, 40% response rate. If we focus on patients more than 100 milligrams uh, in patients that receive or not PD-1 or PDL-1 treatment previously, uh, the response rate was between 38 to 53 uh, percent. Quite impressive. Uh, good tolerability and generally it was quite rare to have any discontinuation to due to drug-related adverse events. And lastly, uh, I've been updated association of osimertinib plus nesitumumab, uh, so a specific uh, monoclonal antibody again a GFR. in the sub cohort with exon 20 insertion. The response rate finally was quite low in comparison to the previous TKI, only 16% confirmed partial response with this type of combination. So interesting, but probably best with the TKI in comparison to this type of association. Well, that was great. Um, just a great whirlwind of all of the exciting new data. For you, Natasha, how will this new adjunct might impact the landscape for EGFR exon 20 insertion on small cell lung cancer? And what factors would you still you to choose. So it's it's just so exciting to have options. You know, it, it seems hard to believe that before May of last year, we, we had nothing for these patients except for chemotherapy. So it's it's just been great. And and I think you know this question of you know kinase, kinase inhibitors versus intravenous and who should get which, or probably more to the point, who should get which drug when. You know, my sense is that these drugs can work sequentially, and so which one should go first. Clearly, you know, from the data we've seen so far, there's no signal about, you know, which works best by insertion location. They all seem to work well across different insertion locations. And so I think for now, we're going to continue to choose by efficacy, toxicity, and patient preference. So, you know, thus far, Mavantamab has the highest response rate uh, and median duration of response, but it's intravenous. Mobisertin is clearly very active in a subgroup of patients with very long median duration of response, but you have to be thoughtful about the diarrhea, but of course it's oral. So, you know, right now it's a real discussion with patients. With these new kinase inhibitors where you've shown us updates, you know, is it possible um, that these kinase inhibitors will have similar activity to the IV agents? And so, you know, I think it's going to be really challenging. CNS metastasis, a real problem with these patients. Patients with brain meds, should they start with some of these newer kinase inhibitors like CLN081 or Sunvisertinib when they're approved? And so I think, you know, moving forward, some of the big questions will be sequencing. We've got so much to learn. We know that amivantamab works in TKI pretreated patients. We know that the TKIs work in amivantamab pretreated patients. So again, you know, the future won't be if. But, uh, but really when, and we'll probably be using both. And of course, figuring out which moves to first line, whether it's a kinase inhibitor or amivantamab plus chemotherapy in the Papillon trial. You know, brain, brain mass is a real challenge in this group. Um, what are some of the ongoing developments in this population of patients, David, for addressing intracranial disease? It's a huge question. We always have this question for this population. We had some interesting data from Mobocertini that had been showed at ASCO from the phase two uh, trial for which uh, they look patient with baseline brain meds and baseline no brain meds, 40 patients with uh, baseline brain meds and 74% of patients, 74% patient uh, with no brain meds at baseline. Uh, it was interesting to see that finally the response rate in the population with brain meds was lower, 25% in comparison to 
patient uh, in patient with no brain meds. Uh, and if patient progress on mobocytinib, 33% uh, at first seat of disease progression in the brain and 17 patient uh, only in the brain. So it appeared to have a lower efficiency on the brain meds. Uh, so we have to need uh, to need to have further data for the mobocytinib, but probably limit activity. It was also showed a trial uh, with another compound, which is a blue uh, 451, supposed to be highly uh, CNS penetrant, uh, supposed to be inhibition of EGFR exon 20 and also atypical mutation, common mutation. Uh, and so the phase one, phase two is ongoing, uh, particularly including patients with brain met not associated with progression neurological symptom, phase one and phase two, and looking at the CNS activity, so probably something to look at. Uh, and finally, we had some data with the CLN081, uh, nice efficiency uh, out of the brain meds. Uh, it was possible to include patients with brain meds, 38% of patients with brain meds at baseline. They just showed three patients uh, with CNS targeted lesion at baseline. One patient achieved a partial response in the brain and out of the brain at cycle 16. One patient was stable on the brain after one year of treatment and one patient progressed at cycle three. Uh, so it's a uh, short data. So we need to have much more data. And currently there is a specific uh, planning uh, study in CNS uh, to look at the efficiency uh, of this uh, compound. So I would be really prudent for the brain meds, Natasha, until now. Uh, and so if we move to the other population, post osimertinib that receive in first line, we have nowadays more and more data, in particular some nice combination uh, and coming from the amivantamab plus lazertinib on the Chrysalis 2 trial. So probably uh, you can't uh, go deeper what have been uh, updated at ASCOA. Sure, thanks. And, and by way of background, you know, last year uh, we presented data from the Chrysalis trial looking at patients who failed osimertinib but were chemotherapy naive. And so with the combination of amivantamab and lazertinib, a third generation kinase inhibitor, we looked at 45 patients. The overall response rate was 36% and the median duration of response was 9.6 months, so very promising. Um, so in this study in Chrysalis 2, they were looking at even more heavily pretreated patients, patients that had failed both osimertinib and chemotherapy, and they actually even included patients with other lines in addition. This was a large cohort, 162 patients, an overall response rate of uh, 33%, median duration of response of 9.6 months. So again, very reminiscent of what we saw with OC-only failure patients. And, and they saw activity no matter how many prior lines of therapy the patient had had. So even if they had had a couple of kinase inhibitors, more chemotherapy, immunotherapy, they saw activity. Toxicity, you know, mostly low grade. They did see pneumonitis in a small number of patients, about 7%. And rash, uh, as you might expect, was the most common toxicity and only 7% of people had to discontinue the combination. And so, you know, what I'm looking forward to seeing from these data are some of what Dr. Park shared with us from Chrysalis 1 last year, which is, you know, if we look at things by MET-IHC expression or some way of being MET-driven or even uh, ongoing EGFR-driven signaling, you know, can that increase? And so, of course, he showed that 9 of 10 patients with MET-IHC-positive tumors had dramatic response to this combination. It'll be nice to see that in this group as well in future. So David, you know, MET amplification or, or other mechanisms for MET during resistance are, are so important after osimertinib. What are some of the updates for new strategies targeting MET amplified lung cancer after failure on osimertinib? We have nowadays, as you know, nice MET inhibitors. So for sure, it's probably a nice place post osimertinib. We had uh, previously a uh, presentation and it already published the Tatun trial, uh, patients that have been exposed to third generation and receive osimertinib plus salvolitinib, which is highly uh, MET specific. And the response rate was quite promising in this population with a MET amplification, 30%. Uh, and nowadays, uh, we are waiting the data from the Savannah phase two uh, global trial, which includes post osimertinib patient with a MET uh, activation pathway, uh, osimertinib plus salvolitinib to confirm uh, the magnitude of benefit. Uh, we had also some preliminary results for the ORCAD phase two trial. It's a biomarker driven trial, different cohort post osimertinib depending on the mechanism of resistance to osimertinib. Uh, one cohort for patient with MET activation, preliminary data, 
20 patients, response rate 41%, uh, and disease control rate 82% of the combination osimertinib plus salvolutinib. We have also the INSIGHT uh, phase 2 uh, trial uh, association of osimertinib plus tepotinib, also in patients post osimertinib with a MET amplification uh, by uh, tissue biopsy or liquid biopsy by NGS, uh, so highly selected patients with a MET activation pathway. And as committing, uh, it was shown uh, the first in class antisemate ADC uh, with this uh, telezotuzumab velotin association with osimertinib phase 1 dose escalation cohort 1.6 mg per kg and 1.9 mg per kg in patient post osimertinib met activation pathway uh, 19 patient uh, and the combination demonstrate potential efficiency, efficiency met activation combination was globally well tolerated mainly toxicity in terms of peripheral sensory neuropathy nausea and peripheral edemia mainly grade 1 or grade 2 toxicity so we should uh, look at this type of uh, toxicity but uh, for sure this is a nice combination with uh, ADC and uh, ADC is really coming something important in the lung field uh, and we have potentially other ADC like uh, ADC which target A3 like patritumab deoxtecan what are the last uh, update of this uh, type of ADC in non-small cell lung cancer but thanks so much, David. And, you know, I just, just sort of backtracking to some of the data you presented. I mean, that's just great to see a 60% response rate after, uh, after osimertinib failure. So it's, it's really exciting. And, you know, this class of drugs is, is so interesting. As you know, last year uh, we heard, or actually two years ago now, we heard at ASCO that in osimertinib resistant patients, which is not direct can, which targets HER3, you know, 83% of our, our HFR positive patients do have HER3 expression, although it's not a recognized driver of resistance. It was a 39% response rate, duration of response, median of seven months. And we also heard about, you know, trope two targeting agents, they put potamab, Jirexican, uh, you know, again, a response rate of 35%, median duration of response of nine and a half months in patients that had EGFR or ALK uh, deranged cancers after kinase inhibitors. So it was interesting at ASCO, you know, we previously heard about um, beta DXD uh, with in, in non EGFR positive tumors. And he, this year at ASCO, uh, Dr. Storyer and colleagues presented data on non EGFR mutant or certainly patients that could not have classic sensitizing mutations and the activity of Patricia Direxican. The overall response rate 28.6%, duration of response 9.4 months progression-free survival, 10.8 months, and about 11% of patients stopped treatment. 11% also developed interstitial lung disease, which is, of course, an important uh, toxicity with these captivitin-based ADCs that we've really seen across, across different agents. So, you know, I think it becomes very interesting when you look at who was in this, patients with squamous cancer, adenocarcinoma, exon 20 insertion. So, you know, it's probably not just specific to HER3 expression or the TROP2 expression if we expand and beyond, um, but these really work, you know, across different tumor types, and I think very interesting for all cancers. So let me uh, conclude. Uh, so we have seen uh, nice data, and particularly post osimertinib treatment option for the EGF remitted patient, particularly combination of amivantamab and lazertinib. For the patient that developed a MET activation pathway, the telizovi plus osimertinib, which showed clear activity in the CEMET of expression of patient, and also the ADC, which target R3, the patridumab deoxtecan, with nice data post osimertinib, but also with other type of EGF mutation. For the exon 20 insertion, we have currently available drug, mobocertinib and amivantamab. We have ongoing phase one, phase two clinical trial with specific tick I, CLN081, the suvozertinib that showed promising data in terms of response rate and PFS. Combination of osimertinib and nesitumumab showed slightly lower response rate in comparison to the tick I, so probably not the best option. And finally, we need to have further data on the brain meds, particularly for the TKI, to be sure for the patient that develop brain meds, uh, we can be efficient with this specific EGFL TKI exon 20 insertion. And so with this, I want to thank uh, Natasha. It was a great discussion. It was a pleasure to have you on board and to discuss all this data from ASCO for the EGFL population. And thank you for your participating in this activity. Please continue on to answer the questions that follow and complete the evaluation. Thank you so much.